I'm Dr. Sherman Silver of the Infertility Center of St. Louis, and it's a pleasure to be part of this SARGE meeting. Uh, Israel is really uh, my virtual home, even though I live in the U.S. in St. Louis, and it's just a thrill the way uh, Israel is able to bring together all of us uh, to share what's new in our field of infertility and reproduction. I've been working for a long time uh, on this uh, for the last 50 years. I think I'm probably the oldest living uh, full-time practicing infertility doctor in the world. I'm really old. But the beauty of that is it's given me a chance to just ride through everything from before 1979 when all we had was microsurgery and then to IVF and from IVF to uh, more microsurgery for uh, obstruction and for tubal reversal, and then to ICSI and vitrification and uh, uh, genetic testing and PGAD. Uh, and uh, even now, uh, we're uh, going into a whole new paradigm, which I will talk about today. I'm following uh, Jerry Shatton, uh, who has always been one of my brilliant role models. And I hope that my uh, talk will begin to be a segue from what he, will, he has talked about. So the title of my talk is Ovarian Longevity and Indeed Longevity, because it's a clue. From stem cells to sperm and eggs, where we've come, beginning from studying the ovary, from ovary freezing and transplantation begun in 1996 uh, to where we are today, where we really understand the ovary better. And that's led us to understand how to make uh, stem cells into sperm and eggs, and in fact, to understand longevity in general. Watch the first slide. This is a patient. There's never been any doubt in my mind that I would get, you know, get the cure to this. I just, once I found out, I just made up my mind. That's it. You have to, you just have to keep taking it one day at a time and just just keep that positive attitude and know that I can do this. I, I will, I'll get through it. So eight o'clock in the morning, uh, July 17th, 1997. We're at uh, St. Luke's Hospital. And uh, we're about to do the first case uh, in the St. Louis area of ovarian tissue freezing. Okay, well, I'm a Dr. Silver, Sherman Silver, the Infertility Center of St. Louis, and we really have a treat right now. Uh, this is Jennifer, who at 24 years of age, I'm right on that yes. right, came down with a terrible case of leukemia. Uh, they thought she was going to die, uh, but just to be safe, in case she lived, <laughs> <when> she did, <laughs> and was cured, uh, we would freeze her over in tissue. So that was like 20 years ago. And uh, this is the first case that we ever did. And we're the only ones right now really actively with a program in the whole United States. And uh, it's been a long time. And we didn't know that we'd be able to transplant the tissue back. And we didn't know if we could culture the tissue. And here she is now. We, we had her on Facebook Live several months ago. And she was happily pregnant. and. Uh, now, look what we have. Now, she's 20, she's 44 years old, if I can reveal that, with a 24-year-old ovary and a beautiful baby. What's her name? Madeline Grace. Madeline Grace. So, uh, Jennifer was just our first case showing how we can beat the biologic clock of the ovary. We were forced to do it for cancer, but we can really do that for anyone now. Now, this uh, chart just shows the age of menopause in a huge Japanese study of 24,000 women. And it pretty much matches a similar graph all around the world. It, it's the same for virtually every human from any race or any ethnic background, that the average age of menopause is 51 years of age. And some people have menopause earlier, some later. And menopause occurs, as we all know, when the ovary runs out of eggs. And that can be measured, in fact, by AMH levels. And if you look at AMH levels in huge populations like Terremoto did uh, in Japan, again, where they have a huge amount of data, you can see, at least from age 28 to age 46, a gradual 
regular decline in the mean AMH level, which means the number of eggs are declining. And eventually, uh, when a woman is down to about 1,000 eggs from her original 400,000 as a teenager, uh, she goes into menopause. Now, we want to compare in vitro derived oocytes, which we can do in mice, uh, to just the regular situation in vivo. So in vitro derived oocytes, which we'll talk about a little while, continue meiosis automatically. And if not fertilized, they soon die. But in vivo, that's not what happens. On the top progression, what you can see is these ogonia and the uh, fetus enter meiosis and then they're, uh, they're arrested and they, they arrest it as primordial follicles, and they don't go on to develop primary follicles until much later in life. There's a gradual release from the primordial stage uh, so that a 1,000 oocytes on average every month uh, leave the primordial follicle stage, four and a half months later become antral follicles and mature follicles ready for ovulation. And then eventually the woman runs out. But if you see below, when we make eggs, uh, at least as a mouse data, uh, from IPS cells derived from skin cells. And uh, what happens is they just go into a meiosis immediately and they're all gone. So if there wasn't some locking mechanism for these follicles, the female fetus would certainly be born without any eggs. And you certainly wouldn't be having eggs until you're 51 years of age. Now, we'll go through the anatomy for a second again in almost all mammals. You see that all these resting follicles, the, the vast majority, it, it's an understatement to say the vast majority, at least in the human, uh, when born, uh, uh, two million eggs are just resting follicles that are these tiny follicles all gathered in the outer ovarian cortex, which is a stiff, tough tissue. Very important to realize that. The inner soft tissue, the medulla, is the direction in which these eggs develop as they leave the resting phase, become primary and secondary follicles, and finally graphene follicles. They go from high pressure tissue pressure on the outer cortex, which is like the tunica albini in the male, and it's really the toughest tissue in the body, towards less dense tissue. That's going to be key to understanding ovarian longevity. And what's shocking to me now is it's going to be a key to understanding longevity. So when we just take out an ovary of a cancer patient, we dissect out the cortex. Uh, well, so we're dissecting out that medulla, and all you see is the cortex. Now, this is a procedure that goes back to Roger Gosden as early as 1996. And the medulla, we would normally throw away. But we don't throw it away anymore because we can find lots of GV follicles. You can almost see those follicles bursting as we're dissecting away the cortex. But at least on the cortex, you can see all of these resting follicles. Virtually almost all of the woman's eggs are located in this outer millimeter, a very, very dense cortical tissue. And then we transplant that tissue onto the denuded medulla of the patient who uh, has no eggs. And in such a position so that the fallopian tube can pick it up naturally, we always do it orthotopically. And so that all of our 27 babies from this were born uh, from natural conception with intercourse, not with IVF. Now, the key to ovarian longevity, again, came to us in the early days of the transplants, when you see that as the FSH comes down to normal at about uh, four months, uh, five months, the AMH, the blue line, goes way, 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 way high above normal. And then after quite a few months, four to eight months, it comes back down to very low levels and then remains low, but the ovary keeps functioning and ovulating for many years, as long as eight to 10 years. But there is an initial depletion as measured by the AMH four and a half months later, which is when you'd expect it. But that means the depletion occurred right at the time of ovary transplant. So we postulated that could be because of the release of cortical tissue pressure. Tissue pressure controls resting follicle recruitment and therefore ovarian longevity. Just take a look, even under the operating microscope, it doesn't require anything fancy. The most dense stroma is on the epithelial surface, then it's less dense, and then it's least dense near the cortical medullary junction. So there is a gradient of tension. And you'll see this has complete control. Uh, it's not hormonal control, complete control over this 
inexorable process of of resting follow recruitment and therefore egg loss and therefore ovarian longevity. So the effect of pregnancy on AMH level is interesting. Anti-malarian hormone declines during pregnancy in the mid and the third trimester, not initially, mid, but then it increases to pre-pregnancy levels about three months following delivery. So what's happened is that during that pregnancy, there's an increase in intra-abdominal pressure and you wind up having a decline in ovarian follicle recruitment during the second half of that pregnancy, and then it comes back to normal once intra-abdominal pressure is released. So suppression of primordial follicle recruitment during pregnancy preserves ovarian reserve and ovarian longevity due to increased abdominal pressure. That's also the reason that women who have uh, multiple babies from uh, Hitterite tribes and uh, Haredi Orthodox Jews in Jerusalem uh, have this amazingly long period of fertility. They just keep on getting pregnant, and uh, and they seem to be quite fertile in their mid-40s. Now, uh, a better study of this to really quantitate it was done by Terramoto in Japan, in which he took his patients, and this is just an example of it, uh, that were pregnant uh, from their IVF, and he measured their AMH and figured on the graph I showed you before what their AMH should have been a year and a half later. And he found out this tremendous difference that uh, the expected drop in AMH, for example, in this uh, 38-year-old patient, was to 2.23 on average, but instead it dropped to 2.51. And he found that in a huge population of 14,000 patients that it held up that pregnancy uh, retarded the normal expected drop in AMH with age. So then uh, we continued our uh, cooperation with the uh, Japanese, with uh, Katsuhiko Hayashi. We've worked with him for some time. Uh, I jokingly call him the X chromosome and I'm the Y chromosome. And uh, Hayashi was able to show that uh, he would culture these uh, eggs that he generated in vitro from stem cells, and he'd culture them under high pressure in an incubator with high pressure. And the pressure caused these uh, caused these oocytes that otherwise would have gone right through meiosis and, and then died, causes them to arrest just as though they were a, a primordial follicle. High compression causes arrest of meiosis and therefore activation of these uh, eggs. And this is the high pressure chamber he used. Now, FOX3 uh, is a nuclear, it's a, it's a marker for egg activation. If the FOX3 is intranuclear, then the egg is arrested. When FOX3 goes extranuclear, you know that egg has been activated. So he was able to show, even with this, that he can prevent activation of these uh, in vitro derived eggs with compression, and he can allow activation by decompression. So tissue pressure regulates, one, resting follicle recruitment, but also ovarian longevity. And let's see what the mechanism, because this is getting more and more fascinating, because it may affect our longevity. So in dormant follicles, which are the resting primordial follicles, the nuclei are always rotating. Watch this in a minute. In recruited oocytes, the nuclei are static. So the outside, you'll see nuclei rotating. Toward the inside of the ovary, you'll see uh, recruited oocytes. Uh, in which the nuclei are no longer rotating. Take a look. This is pretty amazing, the rotation of the arrested uh, oocytes that are, that are not doing anything. And then inside, I'll show it to you again. And uh, you can stop the rotation with decreasing the pressure. But when you, uh, there you go, with increased pressure, the cortex uh, has these uh, nuclei cells rotating, and that prevents their activation and uh, preserves the ovarian uh, reserve. So to summarize about tissue pressure, over-recruitment of primordial follicles is followed by depletion uh, after a transplant. Decreased primordial follicle recruitment occurs with decreasing ovarian reserve, and you will see that's because tissue pressure is less uh, uh, when there are many uh, follicles in the uh, cortex, but tissue pressure is reduced when there are less follicles and there's a greater distance between follicles. Talked about social distancing. When you have distancing between follicles, there is less pressure and therefore uh, uh, there is recruitment. Now, uh, there's a long duration of transplant function, therefore, despite a low AMH, 
But what about late menopause and maltips? I mean, that's because of the fact that uh, they're always pregnant and there's a, always an increase in abdominal pressure, which delays the recruitment of primordial follicles and therefore helps with ovarian longevity. And think for a second about the horse ovary. The horse ovary is just one solid cortex. There is no cortex in media. It's just one solid fibrous ball. And they have very few eggs, but their rate of recruitment is very low and uh, they never go through menopause. They die before they go through menopause. Uh, so longevity and nuclear rotation. Nuclear rotation in oocytes is caused by biomechanical stress or pressure. Nuclear rotation and intranuclear location of FOX3 causes oocytes to temporarily rest in early meiosis. Oocyte arrest allows the ovary to last for 50 years instead of being depleted before birth and controls ovarian longevity. Nuclear rotation occurs everywhere in the body, however, in somatic stem cells also. Stem cells normally have a very slow turnover rate, which is consistent with their longevity. Stem cells have to have a slow turnover rate. That's their function, to continue to provide cells after the progenitor cells have all died. But biomechanical stress, as in exercise, may promote nuclear rotation. It certainly does in vitro, it certainly does in the laboratory, biomechanical stress. So this is uh, the lab in, uh, in Kyushu uh, where uh, Hayashi is doing most of this work and I've been working with him. And uh, then that leads to the whole issue of making sperm and eggs uh, from skin cells, from stem cells. So first you have to know that it all starts here, PGC specification in this very early embryo at, at nine to 10 days. Uh, it starts in this early epiblast when cells that are destined to remain eternal, and that's, the, let's face it, this is our eternity, the germ cells, are separated from the rest of the developing embryo, which has to undergo methylation and, uh, and differentiation into the baby. But the stem cells are set aside very early that are going to remain pluripotent. And this is just a diagram showing what happens from uh, ICM in vivo to the epiblast where the PGCs are, uh, are specified. And that can be done in the laboratory now with regular stem cells derived from skin cells. We can get epiblast cells uh, and then those epiblast cells can be induced all with known genes that can be purchased actually. It's a, you don't have to make these genes. Uh, it can be induced into PGC-like cells and that really function like PGCs. So that was the famous paper in 2016. Hakabi, Ori Hakabi was uh, Hayashi's student with a reconstitution of each of the entire cycle of the mouse female germline. That's uh, Katsuhiko and that's Ori who did most of this work. And I was with them uh, when I uh, was able to observe this uh, firsthand. And there you can see mature oocytes uh, developed uh, from the skin cells that were developed into iPS cells from a mouse that had been ovariectomized. And there are the first two uh, pups, mouse, normal mouse pups, uh, that were derived from the skin of their mother because the mother didn't have an ovary and wasn't derived from the mother's natural eggs. And these pups are normal. So making oocytes or sperm from skin, uh, to summarize, PGC-like cells can become sperm only if injected into the fetal testes, not the adult. Alternately, they can become oocytes only if injected into fetal ovaries incubated with fetal granulosa cells. These sperm and eggs in mouse IVF make normal offspring, and these normal offspring will grow up to be fertile and turn, in turn have more normal offspring naturally. If these PGC-like cells are injected into an adult testis or ovaries rather than fetal, they will just die. And that makes perfect sense because we have made in the laboratory fetal PG, these PGCs are fetal cells. And so naturally, they're not going to differentiate properly into eggs or sperm in an adult ovary or an adult testes. They need a fetal uh, testes. So they need fetal or uh, neonatal gonad, just like in real life. When the fetal primordial germ cells migrate from the epiblast to the gonadal ridge, they differentiate into either spermatogonial stem cells in the seminiferous tubules, or if it's a fetal ovary, they become oogonian oocytes. But what happens normally to PGCs in vivo in the fetus is not what happens uh, if you mix them with 
uh, adult human adult PGC. So we need fetal gonadic somatic cells in the human because it is species specific in order to make these oocytes from skin in the human. And we've done that basically. Uh, this is the first study. I, I think we're the only RV in the world for this right now uh, with Amanda Clark at UCLA and uh, Katsuhiko Hayashi in Japan and uh, Kyle Orwig in Pittsburgh. And we have many of these, but this is just so dramatic. 55-year-old woman who was previously fertile, now in menopause. We did a skin biopsy on her, and she generated young PGCs from her 55-year-old skin cells. And they were perfectly normal PGCs with normal karyotype. So just think about this. Oocytes generated in vitro from IPS cells will be very young. So in the future, when we perfect this, a 38-year-old woman might be better off having a skin biopsy than an oocyte retrieval for IVF because the eggs will be so young. The converting young PGCs to young oocytes is tricky, though. The embryonic stage of germ cell specification in the epiblast is very early. So we therefore should be able to make young oocytes from the young PGCs derived from these old females. But the biggest hurdle in humans is to generate fetal, somatic, gonadal, or granulosa cells from the skin. So we've already, it's been demonstrated by Magyarma Shiro that uh, the, if you try to incubate these uh, PGCs from the human in say uh, mouse granulosa, fetal granulosa cells, they make oocyte-like cells, but they don't really work. They're not competent. It is very species-specific. Mouse ovaries do not provide normal signaling for meiotic entry of human ogonia. It's very species-specific granulosa cells that are needed. So here's our solution. In the female, duplicate what the fetal granulosa cells secrete to transform PGCs into oocytes, or much easier, transform IPS cells into fetal granulosa cells. General growth factors, which are easy to get, can transform, however, human iPS cells into human fetal granulosa cells. So we'd have two lines of development. We develop iPS cells in one set of culture dishes into PGCs and in another set of culture dishes into granulosa cells, and then we'll mix the two. And at least if it looks, works like the mouse, we should be able to get human oocytes and very young oocytes from that. But what about making sperm? Well, this is where Kyle Org's expertise comes in. You have to make SSCs because PGCs injected into adult testes obviously will die. But here's what is fantastic. Uh, they found that, of course, as you probably know, if you inject uh, SSCs, spermatogonial stem cells, into the testes, this has been known since 1994 with Brinster, uh, you will uh, get these SSCs to colonize and undergo spermatogenesis. Uh, but PGCs will only do that in a neonatal test, which is, looks like a fetal test, but it's neonatal, five to 10 days. So in vitro derivation and propagation of spermatogonial stem cells from pluripotent stem cells is very difficult to do. But remarkably, uh, PGCs, although like cells, will, they will not colonize the adult testes like SSC, but in the male, if we inject PGCs into teenage reedy testes, we should be able to get SSCs develop in spermatogenesis. And the reason is, remarkably, this neonatal mouse testis, which is able to convert PGCs into sperm, is analogous really to the 14-year-old human testis. So for the male, we may not need fetal testis. We may just be able to inject these in vitro generated PGCs right into the uh, young adolescent. And here's a picture of how we do it. I'll, I'll close with this because it's an exciting view. We're doing this right now in humans. We have a lot of humans. We're practicing on doing this. Uh, we haven't yet injected the PGC-like cells or SSCs, but we're practicing this to make sure we can get it perfect every time because it's critical uh, that you don't uh, mess up this injection. But take a look and you'll be very excited about this. I'll be quiet while you just watch the injection. First, that's the reedy testes. And it has a different anatomy than you may have thought. It's like a straight line in primates. And now watch it colonize all these seminiferous tubules. So all we'll have to do is inject in vitro generated PGCs into the reedy testes of 14-year-olds. And we anticipate we will then get normal spermatogenesis. 
So uh, I think that uh, completes my uh, my talk on going from ovarian longevity, which uh, Jerry Shatton brought up, uh, to the whole issue of our longevity in general. And I recommend everybody exercise regularly uh, to create uh, uh, myotonic stress, to create uh, uh, high dynamic stress in your tissue so that your stem cells uh, will continue their nuclear rotation so that they will last longer and will live longer. That latter, of course, is a speculation, but it's a ripe area for research. That nuclear rotation could be one key to longevity in general, not just longevity of the ovary. And then our ultimate longevity is the magic production of these germ cells uh, from the epiblast cells separated from the rest of the developing embryo very early in embryonic life. So it's an exciting uh, period for us, and uh, I'm excited that we're able to have this meeting and discussion here in Israel.